get a lot of flack from the other rap artists because I refuse to uh, rap their particular style or, or pretend like life is always so bad, everything is hardcore, when I think as a person, there's many characteristics uh, you know, to an individual's personality. So we thought, oh, we go to Church Boy. We'll go with MC Hammer, but he was the most gangster one of all of us. I heard about it. Do you really know the unexpected dark side of MC Hammer beyond his catchy tunes and dance moves? While his public persona beams with a flashy rapping career, there's a hidden layer steeped in gangster activities that's less known. Surprisingly, some considered him even more formidable than Suga Knight, marking him as the most feared figure in certain circles. But what led to this stark contrast between his public image and underground reputation? Early Life Before we find out how MC Hammer got his reputation as the most feared thug of his time, let us first take a journey into his early life and the intricacies leading up to him earning the reputation. MC Hammer's life would not have been described as cozy by those who knew him and the struggles that he went through in his early life. Stanley Kirk Burl, popularly known as MC Hammer, was born in Oakland, California on March 30, 1962. His father, Louis Burrell, worked as a warehouse supervisor for several years. He was also a professional poker player and a gambling casino manager at the Oaks Card Club's card room. Just one of eight siblings, the Burrell family already struggled to get by. However, Louis Burrell's gambling problems would drive the family to near ruin. The money his father managed to scrape by from his jobs and his mother's job as a secretary was insufficient to care for a family of 10. MC Hammer recalled how six children of the eight had to manage the small space of the three-bedroom housing project apartment that they lived in. When he was just five years old, Stanley's parents separated, leaving them with just their mother to raise them. Although things became more difficult with only a single source of income now that their father had disappeared from their lives, taking what little support he'd been able to offer, MC Hammer never adopted his father's gambling ways as a means to escape the reality of their situation. Determined to not cause his mother grief by leading a life of crime, MC Hammer not only stayed away from gambling, but also from the crimes that surrounded them in their neighborhood. However, he was also not content with the hardship that they faced as a family. When he was just a child, MC found ways to earn some money by hustling tickets and reselling them in the parking lot of the Oakland Coliseum. He also sold baseballs and danced to the tune of a beatboxer. The young boy already had affiliations with the Oakland athletics team and was familiar with all of them as a result of his brother who held jobs with the team. His passion for dance and entertainment was clear to see by all who watched him. MC Hammer's opportunity to earn more money would come on a fateful evening when the Oakland Athletics team owner, Charlie Finley, saw the 11-year-old doing the splits and dancing remarkably. He was so impressed by him that he hired him off the bat, making him the clubhouse assistant. Hammer dedicated himself to his role, leaving no avenue for Finley to find any faults with him that would lead to the termination of his job. Hammer was not only the clubhouse assistant, but he was also a bat boy. A job that had been offered to him as a result of his excessive amount of energy and flair when Finley watched him dance. Hammer would go on to serve as a bat boy with the team for seven years between 1973 and 1980. However, in a later interview in 2010, when asked about his role in the team, Hammer would explain that although he had been labeled as the bat boy, it wasn't his official role. That role belonged to his brother, Lewis Burrell. Hammer's role was to take calls and do play-by-plays for Finley, who was almost always absent during the team's game every summer. Finley lived in Chicago and needed someone he could count on to take account of everything that had happened during his absence from the games. Hammer earned his nickname from Reggie Jackson, a Major League Baseball player who played for Oakland at the time. According to Jackson, the then 13-year-old was responsible for running the team and communicating with Charlie Finley. He gave Hammer the nickname because he thought he looked like Hank Aaron, who had the nickname The Hammer. Jackson was not the only one to notice the facial similarities he shared with Aaron. Pedro Garcia, another team player, also nicknamed him Little Hammer, 
due to his resemblance with Aaron. Hammer was promoted from being just an informant and clubhouse assistant to being the executive vice president of the club. He quoted Finley as he recalled the day he had gotten the news. I'm getting you a new hat. I don't want you to have a hat that says A's on it. I'm getting you a hat that says XVP. You're running the joint around here. Hammer wasn't the only nickname he received from the baseball teammates. He'd also been nicknamed Pipeline because he was an informant for Finley and they knew it. The nickname MC would come later, being an abbreviation for Master of Ceremonies. Hammer began performing at various clubs whenever he was on the road with the baseball team and would continue with this even in the military. Since he was currently surrounded by baseball players, Hammer dreamed of becoming a professional baseball player himself and went as far as playing in high school. Unfortunately, his dreams would not become a reality when he failed to make the final cut during tryouts at the San Francisco Giants. Although his dreams of becoming a baseball player had ended with his failure to make it into the San Francisco Giants, Hammer did not let that disappointment creep into other areas of his life. In 1980, at 18, Hammer graduated high school from McClyman's High School in Oakland. He began his college education at a local college studying communications, however he dropped out later to join the United States Navy for three years. Hammer served with Patron 47, VP 47, of NAS Moffett Field in Mountain View, California, as a Petty Officer 3rd Class Aviation Storekeeper, AK-3, until he was honorably discharged. From dancing on the streets to becoming Vice President at the age of 13 and then serving in the U.S. Navy, Hammers took an eventful turn. However, Hammers' success story started years before, although he wouldn't realize it until later. Music and entertainment. Hammer's musical career had started while he was still a child, with his dance acts. It had carried on into his teenage years. Even as he worked on his desire to play professional basketball amidst all the other things he was doing at such a young age, Hammer never abandoned his music career. After the three years he spent in the Navy, Hammer returned to Oakland and to performing once again. However, this time he didn't stick to strictly performing in clubs. He wanted more for himself. Hammer launched his own record label with money he borrowed from Mike Davis and Dwayne Murphy, two former players at Finley's Baseball Club. He released two of his own albums through his record label, Bust It Productions. Feel My Power was released in 1987, and the following year he released Let's Get It Started. The two turned out to be successful enough to bring him enough attention and a deal with Capitol Records. Hammer produced and recorded many rap songs, although he never made them public, and the reason for that is not known. Bust It Records was not the only record label Hammer owned, also creating Oaktown Records in full blast. The talents he signed to his label like James Greer and B. Angie B., amongst others, all collaborated with him or produced music of their own while signed to his label. In the mid-1980s, before the creation of his label, Hammer rapped in small venues to make a living and hopefully be discovered by labels that would take an interest in his style of music and help him to achieve his dreams of being successful. However, after a record deal he signed went south, Hammer borrowed $20,000 to create his own record. The business did not grow overnight, as Hammer tried everything he could to make sure that his company wouldn't go under, including selling records from his car and basement. Hammer was destined for success, however, as he had one thing other rappers lacked, a dancing ability and rap style that bordered on uniqueness and intrigued people. Now known as MC Hammer, he recorded his debut album, Feel My Power, and originally released it on his own label. The song sold over 60,000 copies with his resilient marketing. Hammer relied mostly on street marketing since he had more connections on the street than to any other label owners. The song became very popular at dance clubs in the San Francisco Bay Area. In 1988, after the release of Let's Get It Started, Tony Valera, a radio DJ, played the song in his mix shows, earning it even more popularity. The track was a hit in nightclubs as well. With the sudden rise in his label and musical career, 
Hammer took things further by hiring a group of dancers, musicians, and backup vocalists for rehearsals every day of the week. His relentless push for success would pay off and lead to his big break in 1988. His stage presence, which was a class act, had brought him even more recognition. During a performance in an Oakland club, Hammer impressed a record executive, who at the time didn't know who he was, but knew he was somebody. Following the launch of his record label, Hammer had received several offers from other record labels, but continued to decline their offers. This time, he agreed to a multi-album contract with Capitol Records with a $1,750,000 advance. The contract would turn out to be beneficial for both parties, as it was not long before Capitol Records regained the money they'd paid him, and even more. After he was signed into Capitol Records, Hammer released a revised version of his first album, Feel My Power. Although the album had sold over 60,000 copies then, an accomplishment for the rapper, it turned out to be much more successful, selling more than he could have ever imagined possible. The album, with a few additional tracks added to it, sold over 2 million copies, earning him a lot of money. Let's Get It Started was one of the most popular singles from the album, along with some others like Pump It Up, Turn This Mother Out, and They Put Me In The Mix. Despite his sudden rise from the bottom of the barrel, Hammer was not satisfied with the success he'd gained. He wanted more, and for him, it was either he got it or he continued trying. Hammer changed the style of his music, shifting from the standard rap he'd practiced to something more musical. This change would, however, not come without its challenges and criticisms. He was criticized for trading in what the core of rapping was all about. To them, he had become more of a dancer than a rapper. Although their opinions must have stung, Hammer wasted no time in defending the style he had made his own. In his own words, people were ready for something different from the traditional rap style. The fact that the record has reached this level indicates the genre is growing. As a result of the friendship he had with Arsenio Hall and Van Winkle, popularly known as Vanilla Ice, although there would be rumors circulating later that the two had some underlying issues which they would only address at the peak of their career when they reunited to perform at a concert in Salt Lake City, Utah in 2009. Hammer was invited to perform his song, You Can't Touch This, before it was released. He performed it in Dancing Machine on the Arsenio Hall Show in 1989. Dancing Machine would appear in Please Hammer, Don't Hurt Him, the movie, 1990. With some of the money he made from his album, he installed a recording studio in the back of his tour bus where he would record his second album. In 1989, Hammer featured in Glenn Goldsmith's album, don't Turn This Groove Around on the song You've Got Me Dancing. Unfortunately, although it was his very first release in the UK, and he had hoped to spread the reach of his music past the US, the song did not reach the heights they were expecting it to, failing to chart. In 1990, Hammer released his third album, which would also turn out to be his second major label release, Please Hammer, Don't Hurt Him, on February 12, 1990. The track, You Can't Touch This, was featured in the album and turned out to be very successful. It was produced, recorded, and mixed by Felton Pilot and James Early on Hammer's tour bus in 1989. Unfortunately, although the track, You Can't Touch This, was a crowd favorite, it did not make it to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The album, on the other hand, was a number one success for 21 weeks, Ironically, as a result of the single, You Can't Touch This. The song has appeared in many films and TV shows, soundtracks, and compilations. You Can't Touch This remains one of MC Hammer's most successful songs of all time. Hammer had more success with his other releases. His song, Prey, was his biggest hit in the US, peaking at number two. Prey was also a major success in the UK, reaching number eight on the charts. The album would become the first hip-hop album to earn diamond status, creating a legacy for Hammer and selling more than 18 million. As his career peaked, MC Hammer toured Europe extensively, including a sold-out concert at the National Exhibition Center in Birmingham. In 1991, the CEO of Pepsi, Christopher A. Sinclair, went on tour with him,
with the sponsorship of PepsiCo International. Hammer's album was instrumental in increasing the popularity of hip-hop music, and it remains hip-hop's all-time best-selling album. Despite Hammer's success in his music career, he soon began to receive backlash and criticism due to the over-repetitive nature of his lyrics, clean-cut image, and his large reliance on sampling hooks created by others for his singles. However, Hammer's career continued to flourish and be highly successful. He toured Asia, Europe, Australia, and Russia. Immediately after his tour, Hammer merchandise was marketed, including MC Hammer Mattel dolls and lunchboxes. As a result of his popularity, he also had his own Saturday morning cartoon called Hammerman, which he voiced. Although Hammer was successful in his music career, he did not limit himself strictly to music, choosing instead to engage in other interesting ventures. Business Ventures In 1991, as the money continued to pour in from his music career, Hammer ventured into business, establishing Oaktown Stable. The stable would eventually come to have 19 thoroughbred racehorses. In that same year, his horse, Light Light, would become one of the top three-year-old fillies racing in the state. She won several grade one stakes races, including Kentucky Oaks. Many of his horses would go on to win races as well, making it a very successful enterprise for Hammer. Between the late 1990s and early 2000s, Hammer created a clothing line called J Slick and would work on MC Hammer USA, which was an interactive online portal. In 2002, Hammer would go on to sign a book contract with Simon & Schuster for a book which was bound to be released in 2003. Unfortunately, the manuscript for the book, which was to be called Enemies of the Father, Messages from the Heart on Being a Family Man, was never submitted in 2003, even though Hammer had been paid in advance for it. The company would sue Hammer, seeking the return of the $61,000 Hammer received in advance for the unwritten book. Hammer was also involved in several internet projects, known for being a web mogul and activist. In 2007, Hammer became the co-founder and CSO of Menlo Park-based Silicon Valley Dance Jam .com, comma, partnering with Jeffrey Arone. The site was valued at $4.5 million and was an exclusive dance site, featuring dance competitions, techniques, and styles which would sometimes be rated by Hammer. It closed down four years later. Before the close of the site, Hammer moved on to a mixed martial arts management company to manage, market, and promote fighters. Hammer's interest in boxing had been quite obvious throughout his career, and he showed it by not only opening the company, but also launching a clothing line dedicated to alchemist clothing in that same month. In October 2011, Hammer announced that he would be creating a new internet venture called WireDo, which was a deep search engine. He intended to compete and possibly outdo other search engines, including Google and Bing. His motto was, search once and see what's related. Although his production team planned to open the site to beta testers to check its functionality, WireDo never fully came into existence before the project was abandoned. MC Hammer also produced and starred in his movie, choosing not to limit himself to only the musical aspect of the entertainment industry. His film, Please Hammer Don't Hurt Him, was produced in 1990. The film was about a rapper who returned to his hometown and defeated a drug lord taking advantage of kids as a means to traffic his product. Although it was the first film he produced, Hammer earned a Grammy Award for Best Long Form Music Video. He also appeared in many major marketing campaigns for different companies including Pepsi, KFC, Toshiba, Taco Bell and such. He would go on to appear in other movies like Reggie's Prayer in 1996, The Right Connections, 1997, etc. Hammer also appeared in two cable television movies. A co-producer for the VH1 movie Too Legit, The MC Hammer Story, which aired on December 19, 2001, detailed the rise and fall of MC Hammer, becoming the second highest rated original movie in the history of VH. Hammer proudly said, the whole script came from me. I sat down with the writer and gave him all the information. In 2003, Hammer would appear as a dance judge on Dance Fever, 
a 2003 ACB family series. Hammer's tracks have been used in so many movies and series, including The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and The Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. Hammer's dancing style is still being taught to this day, despite the number of dances that have faded away between the period of his celebrated dance skills and now. It was the major difference between him and other performers during his time, other than the bell-like hammer pants he always wore that became his trademark signature. While his tracks were great, his very lively dance steps were as much an important part of his whole performance as his music was. Although Hammer often added his own twists to the dance, making them his own, he borrowed dance styles from James Brown and the Nicholas Brothers, including the splits, leaps, and slides. He created dances like the Hammer Dance, the Bump, and the Running Man. As you may have noticed, his legs were a very important part of his routine which was why he had his legs insured for an amount well into the millions, a fact he mentioned in an interview with Maria Shriver in 1990. Following his insurance, an injury to the knee put a stop to his dancing for some time. Now, why was MC Hammer considered the most feared thug of his time, and who were the people he must have shown a side of him so dangerous and entirely different from his happy-go-lucky persona that had earned him that reputation? The Beef with Redman Despite his contribution to putting hip-hop and rap style out there, Hammer received a lot of hate for his very eccentric taste in fashion and music style. At the peak of his career, Hammer was far from what anyone would consider a gangsta rapper. With parachute pants and highly choreographed dance steps, Hammer was considered a sellout by those who should have celebrated him. In 1994, tired of being the butt of jokes, Hammer tried to showcase himself as a tough guy on his album The Funky Headhunter. However, he received even more backlash for that, both from fans who couldn't stomach the massive change and from other artists who believed him to be faking. Despite their despise and jests, one thing remained clear to those who had a brush with him. Underneath the smiles and the parachute pants, which showcased him as a great performer, Hammer was not one to be messed with, although most artists believed him to be an easy target for their jibes. Redman would be one of those who learned it the hard way. In his debut album, which featured the skit Funky Uncles, Redman, in a one-minute interlude, was heard saying, He ain't shit. Hammer ain't doing nothing for us. He ain't shit. You ain't shit. His mama ain't shit. His daddy ain't shit, ain't nobody shit. Although Hammer responded to him in a track of his own, all was not forgiven and forgotten as Redman had thought. He continued recalling how Hammer had responded to the record. That goddamn MC Hammer? Very serious about beef. Y'all motherfuckers laugh and y'all joke about Hammer? No, 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 no. That nigga was deep with niggas. Anybody who talks shit come to the Bay Area? They was in for it, cause we seen it. I seen it. And he was very serious about beef. Oh, you gonna talk about my dancing pants? I'll see you. And he would whoop a nigga out. In a 1994 interview with Rap City, Hammer spoke on the skit, stating he hadn't been pleased when he heard Funky Uncles. Redman, when he came out with his album, he has a little skit on the front of it that says something about Hammer. So to me, he's just another little punk. So I checked him on the album and put him in his place. Redman would come face to face with Hammer three years after the skit was released and realize that Hammer still had not let go of those words. That nigga came up to me on Yo! MTV Raps on the last episode they had, Redman said. That nigga approached me. He was like, Red, I'ma tell you something. You young, but I don't allow nobody talking about my mama. You understand me? I said, yes, sir. Redmond spoke on the reason why he had been so non-confrontational when he met Hammer, stating that he had nearly been jumped by Hit Squad when he was in the Bay Area. We was already in Oakland with EPMD and we damn near had to up out of there for that, cause they had niggas back here, back here, back, we had to get the fuck up out of here. They wasn't playing. We was almost boxed in. He spoke once again about his meeting with Hammer on Yo! One MTV Rap, saying, He shook my hand and was like, You a youngin'. I like what you do. But you just know I don't play nobody talking about my mama. 
He next spoke on the event again to combat Jack in 2012, and this time he was more descriptive in the interview. Niggas think Hammer's a sucker. Hammer don't fucking play. Hammer don't play. He dances and he's very athletic and he'll whoop a nigga's ass. Redman also pointed out how conciliatory he was at the Yo! MTV Raps encounter, saying that his response when Hammer pointed out his distaste with Redman's mention of his mother was pacifying. Yo, Hammer, man, you was big. Look, man, I ain't got no beef with you, my dude. You a OG. I'm a young cat. A hit on MC Search. There have been numerous claims from MC Search that MC Hammer put a hit on the group, New York's third base, because of a lyric in their song, The Cactus. With Hammer being at the top in the rap industry at the time, many artists took to airing their jealousy and doubts over his credibility by calling him out on their songs, and MC Search was one of them. However, much like Redman, they included his mother in their track. The Cactus turned Hammer's mother out. This was allegedly a play on words. The Cactus album from Third Base and Hammer's record from the same year turned this mother out. Much like with Redman, Hammer wouldn't forget about the slight on his mother. In 2015, Search mentioned on The Ed Lover Show that he had received death threats from Hammer's brother, Louis Burl, while on a flight to Los Angeles. We're in the air and Carmen Ashurst Watson, who was the president of Def Jam at the time, picks up the phone and hears someone say, is third base on their way to LA? And she goes, yeah. And the voice says, good, they're dead. This is Louis Burrell. Search claims to have confirmed that there was a $50,000 hit on him, confirmed by Eric B. and that it was supposed to be carried out by the Los Angeles Crips. In a later interview, he would say that the fear and anger over the incident had remained with him. I'm not good, he said on Vlad TV in 2018. I've been through 25 years of therapy three days a week. I am not good. I wish I could be good. But when somebody tries to kill you over a rap lyric, Understand what it feels like to not know that you can turn a corner without someone trying to kill you for $50,000. Baptism of Jay-Z Hammer has also had beef with some notable names in the industry, including Jay-Z. In his verse in Kanye West's So Appalled, Jay-Z dissed Hammer saying, Hammer went broke so you know I'm more focused slash I lost 30 mil so I spent another 30 slash because unlike Hammer, 30 million can't hurt me. Annoyed by Jay-Z's decision to attack him, Hammer released the music video, Better Run Run, where he accuses Jay-Z of being in league with the devil. In the music video, the lookalike is chased by a character disguised as the devil. However, MC Hammer defeats the devil in the video, allowing a scared Jay-Z to run past him. Then he forces Jay-Z to be baptized by him. MC Hammer, however, revealed that his feud with Jay-Z was less about his financial struggles and more about Jay-Z's use of Christian imagery and themes as referenced in Empire State of Mind. Hammer found these to be annoying and took the opportunity to let Jay-Z know of his stance on the matter. Jay-Z claims not to have known that Hammer's financial struggle was a sore subject. He did not want to be put up for discussion or worse, in a diss track, continuing that he said some great things about Hammer in his book, and had not realized that he was wrong to have dissed the rapper who he respects so much. These are some of the people MC Hammer has had beef with in the past, and yet, despite that, he continues to remain likable and respected, proving himself to be the most feared thug of his time. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to receive more videos like this one.